Okay, uh, I want to do just um, one of these lectures. Uh, I will try to keep it um, brief and to the point uh, about the Manhattan Project and the atomic bomb. Because it changed the world and it changed the United States and it's an important part of the Cold War. What you're looking at there, believe it or not, I find a little hard to believe, but it's the truth. That's ground zero. This little monument there stands directly under the spot where a few hundred feet above it the first atomic weapon used in warfare was detonated. That is in Hiroshima <coughs> in Japan. You can see there's a parking garage back here now. This is an apartment complex. At the time of the um, of the atomic bombing, that was actually a hospital. The uh, atomic bomb that ca came down on Hiroshima um, missed its target. Its original target was uh, a bridge several blocks over. Hang on. Um, the bomb was actually supposed to fall over here. Uh, right at the junction of um, bridge. This is an island in one of the um, rivers that, that opens up into Hiroshima's harbor. And as often happens with bombs, you drop them from high up and they drift. There's wind and so on. And it actually landed over here, which was, as I said, on top of a hospital. So a little bit away from where they expected it to. Today, uh, this is what that same area looks like. The actual spot for ground zero where the bomb fell is over here just off uh, camera a little bit. And as I showed you, it, this really, um, it's remarkable how un <laughs> unmarked that site is. Uh, one of the things that was left up is this. This is the um, industrial exhibition building. It was a kind of museum uh, which was one of the few buildings. It's not far from Ground Zero and it was left in the condition that it was left by the bomb as a kind of monument uh, and there you have the little park there. Um, so we need to talk about the atomic bomb and what it meant and how it happened. 1939 uh, atomic energy was still in its infancy. Um, they were really just beginning to understand a little bit about how it worked and how it might be used. August 2nd, 1939, as you can see, this is a month before Germany actually starts the war in Europe. Albert Einstein wrote a letter to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, Einstein was not only already the legend, I mean to call somebody Einstein then was just what it meant now, um, but he was also a man of um, peace. Uh, he was a uh, uh, largely a pacifist, but in the face of Hitler, he found that it was hard to hold that position. In August of 39, he wrote to FDR as the world's greatest atomic scientist, talking to him a little bit about what's been going on in atomic energy and pointing out that this new phenomenon would also lead to the construction of bombs and it is conceivable, though much less certain, that extremely powerful bombs of a new type may be constructed. A single bomb of this type, carried by boat and exploded in a port, might well destroy the whole port together with some of the surrounding territory. However, such bombs might well prove to be too heavy for transportation by air. They didn't know. Uh, they had never built one, so they didn't know yet. But he was concerned Einstein was about um, the fact that Germany also had atomic scientists and they might well be working on it. And so he warns Roosevelt. 
Einstein's letter of August was held on to by the committee of scientists that had gone to Einstein asking him to write it. Um, they arrange a meeting with Roosevelt for October of 39. So this is now after Hitler has invaded Poland and the war has broken out. And at that meeting, they present Einstein's letter to FDR and they urge Roosevelt to beat the Germans, basically, to um, a bomb. Um, they're convinced that the German scientists will find one and that if the United States doesn't get there first, um, the Germans will use it against us or anybody else. FDR hears what they're saying and decides to approve the project, which gets the name Manhattan Project. Uh, it's called that because it's given to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The Corps of Engineers is the branch of the U.S. Army that's in charge of all kinds of things, everything from um, dredging ports to make sure that they stay deep enough for ships to pass, to building dams, to figuring out how to get through walls and barbed wire fences, but also to some pretty heavy <coughs> scientific uh, research, particularly during the Second World War. The Corps of Engineers is organized into districts. Um, and so this is given, the responsibility for this project is given to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Manhattan District, based in New York City, uh, which is where it gets the name Manhattan Project. There were actually other projects out there. If those of you who are interested in technology and so on, um, there was just, for instance, the Boston Project, which was Army Corps of Engineers in Boston, uh, which really gave the world radar as we know it. They invented radar as we understand it. Okay, so they give them the Manhattan Project. There's a little side note here. Um, they will never ask you this on AP, but you're Staten Island kids. This picture is, a, is of a guy named Edgar Sengier, S-E-N-G-I-E-R. And Sengier was a, a businessman from Belgium who got involved with mining. Um, the Belgian, Belgians owned a big chunk of Central Africa called the Belgian Congo, and Sengier got involved with mining there, and uranium was discovered there. Now, back in the 1930s, people knew uranium was valuable, and it was rare, but people didn't know you could make a weapon from it. Sengier gets involved in the mining business and the uranium business and finds out from some of his scientist friends that there is talk and this is as far back as about 38 39 that that you could, might be able to build an atomic bomb um Tsinjir is a very forward thinking guy and is afraid that the ore the uranium ore will fall into the wrong hands so he packs all of it that he can get out of the Congo onto a ship and takes it to New York City to an obscure little warehouse on Staten Island at the foot of the Bayonne Bridge and stores it there, just leaves it there. Some years later, while the Manhattan Project is up and running, they are having tremendous trouble getting enough uranium ore to get enough uranium. You can process tons and tons of uranium ore and come up with a teaspoonful of useful uranium, so you need a lot of it. Well, Sanjir comes forward and says, you know, I actually have a warehouse full of this stuff on Staten Island. So the uranium for the atomic bombs actually comes from Staten Island, right beneath where the Bayonne Bridge is today. And in fact, it has left its footprint because there is a light trace of radioactivity in the area where that warehouse was. Again, that's just trivia. Okay, so once the Manhattan Project is launched, um, these two men wind up being put in charge of it. There's some, um, uh, you know, th there's some development here, but I'm, I'm giving you the short version. This is J. Robert Oppenheimer, 
Oppenheimer was the chief scientist of the Manhattan Project, um, one of the leading atomic scientists in the United States of America at the time. He put together a team of scientists that included guys like Enrico Fermi, the Italian uh, physicist, um, uh, Edward Teller, who will become important later during the Cold War, uh, Edward Gillard, uh, really all of, the, all of the greatest physicists in the United States had some kind of work that they were doing on this. Leslie Groves was a um, two-star general in the Army Corps of Engineers there, and he was the military guy in charge of the project. And this is a general map, um, and I can tell you, even from what I know, an incomplete map of the Manhattan Project. Um, this was not something that was done in, in New York City. And as you read about Los, Anima, uh, Los Alamos lab and Alamogordo lab, um, it wasn't even just done there. It involved um, units all over the United States, most of whom did not know what they were working on. Um, I, I, th they enlisted the very top physics scholars and engineers, and they enlisted a hell of a lot of college kids and graduate students who were on the cutting edge. I mean, think of it today. If you wanted to start a um, cutting-edge computer project, you might hire an awful lot of 19, 20-year-olds in the middle of college who are just, you know, computer nuts and really know their stuff and are developing things. And that's kind of what was going on here. And as I said, most of them didn't really know what they were working on. They were just given little bits and pieces of this project to figure out. I had a, when I was in high school, I had a physics teacher, um, a Jesuit priest, who was doing his physics degree at Columbia University. And they had a whole ton of these kids at Columbia working on this project, figuring out equations, formulas, um, that they really didn't know what they were for, but they were working on the pure physics end of it. Um, Oak Ridge was, <coughs> um, the where the nuclear reactor was that was um, uh, purifying, refining um, the uranium. It was during the, this is how cutting edge this is, it was during the Manhattan Project as part of the program to take the uranium ore and develop it into the isotope that you need to make an atomic bomb. Um, it was during that process that they discovered a new element, plutonium, which turned out to be one of the elements that was used for the second bomb. So you had things going on all over the place. University of Chicago, uh, where the, the, the first real nuclear reactor was running, um, they put it underneath the University of Chicago's football stadium, which is part of the reason why they don't have a football team anymore. Um, so you had all of these people around the country working on this, but really it was all filtering down to Los Alamos, which um, was where the, the main uh, lab was. In the meantime, um, while the scientists are working to figure out how nuclear reaction works, how radioactivity works, and whether you could make a bomb out of it, and if you could, how you made a bomb out of it. While they're busy working on that, um, the war continues on. April 12th, 1945, Franklin Delano Roosevelt dies rather suddenly. He's on vacation in, uh, in Warm Springs in Georgia, which is where he, he went for his vacations. Um, and uh, by that time, FDR was quite ill. Yeah, it, it, you all know he had had polio uh, uh, as a younger man. He was an adult when he got it, but he was a younger man. And um, even though he survived the polio, it, it left physical problems, one of which was um, galloping blood pressure. He had extremely high blood pressure. And um, if you see films of it, you can, you can go look it up. 
of his last appearance before Congress, for instance, um, he he comes into Congress and he is sitting down in his uh, in his wheelchair, which is unheard of. He was never seen in public in it. But his last appearance of Congress, he, he couldn't even get out of it. He he, and you can see how worn out he is. Um, it it's famous, you know, if you look at the presidents of the United States if they serve a four-year or eight-year term, they don't look like they've served four or eight years. They look like, they look like they've aged 20. And with FDR, um, who uh, became president in 32, and then uh, or was elected in 32, and then was elected again in 36, and then was elected again in 40, um, and then, you know, had the, the 44 election... Um, during the uh, Great Depression and the Second World War, even the healthiest man would have been ripped apart by the stress. He died, therefore, on, on the one hand, how shall I say, it's not surprising that he passed away when he did. On the other hand, it was a surprise to everybody because nobody really expected it. Um, they kind of thought he would just go on forever. And nobody outside of the inner circles in Washington knew how sick he really was. Um, and there were a lot of things that were kept secret because he dies at lunch. He is sitting at, at lunch and um, gets up, half gets up from the table and says, I have a terrific headache and falls over and he's dead, um, apparently of a sudden massive stroke. And he dies in the arms of his secretary, who was also his mistress, whom Eleanor knew he had had a mistress years before, and ha he had sworn up, down, and sideways that they had broken up. And so he discovers, she discovers, when she gets the call that he's dead, not only that she ha that uh, his mistress has been with him all along, but that her daughter was helping to cover up for this. Um, that that was a really difficult blow for her. Again, they won't ask you that on AP, but it just sort of gives you the human dimension. So she has to go down to um, Georgia to pick up her husband's body. The nation has been just worn out, wrung out by war. They have lost this leader that there are many people in the country that he's the only president that they, you know, kids, that he's the only president they've ever, they've known. Um, for a lot of adults, he's the only president they can remember having. He's led them through this war, and now he's, they're suddenly lost to him. So there's a trauma there for the country. There's obviously a trauma there for her because it's, it's her husband who's gone. And yet at the same time, she's finding out that he's been cheating on her all this time and that her family's been complicit in it. So it was a, a difficult human moment. Well, when the word gets to Washington within um, minutes that uh, the president has passed away, um, they run and get their hands on Harry Truman. Truman had been a senator from Missouri and had been a critic of the um, Roosevelt administration, uh, not uh, the New Deal program, but had been kind of a pain in the neck for investigating misappropriation of defense funds. You're in the middle of a war, right, and there's lots of money flowing around. The, the Department of War, which is in charge of the Army at that point, we weren't calling it Department of Defense yet, and the Department of the Navy are throwing money left, right, and center all over the place. And some of it is going to very good causes, and some of it is you know, probably being used inefficiently and a little bit wastefully, and some of it is being outright stolen and cheated on. And Truman is an investigator in the Congress to find this out. Well, he gets to be such a pain in the neck that Roosevelt's people decide to neutralize him by um, inviting him to run for vice president with them. <coughs> and so that's how Truman winds up being vice president. As vice president, um, he is utterly, completely, and totally cut out of the loop. 
He lives in a residential hotel in Washington. Um, he attends no cabinet meetings. He is briefed by nobody. He um, meets Roosevelt just a couple of times, basically for a handshake. Nobody tells him anything about anything. So he's in complete ignorance of the running of the government and the conduct of the war and everything else when he's sworn in suddenly to be president. Two weeks after he's sworn in, Henry L. Stimson, remember him, uh, Secretary of War, um, goes to meet with him and pulls him inside and says, basically, uh, uh, by the way, Mr. President, I thought maybe you should know about this. Um, for the past five or six years, we've been working on a super weapon, and let me tell you about it. And he, this is the first moment that Truman has even had hinted to him that there is such a thing as a Manhattan Project. Okay. Well, by July 1945, the Manhattan Project down in New Mexico at this point had three bombs ready to go. Two were uranium-based bombs, one was plutonium. This is not a physics course, so I'm not going to, you know, and they will not ask for the mechanics of this. Some of you may have some interest in science, so I'm just going to take a half a minute to do this. This is basically how a um, plutonium bomb works. In the center, you have two hemispheres, two half-spheres of plutonium. Plutonium, a highly radioactive um, metal. And in, in the stuck in the center of a thing called a neutron initiator, which just sort of is super, super radioactive and is shooting out neutrons. Okay. Surrounding this plutonium core is uh, a set of conventional explosives, regular explosives, that are set in a very specific, very particular pattern. The point of it is that when they go off, they go off all at the same time, and they ram the entire plutonium core into itself. Think of yourself as if you had an orange uh, in both hands. You're surrounding with both hands, and you just squeeze the thing to compress it down. That's the idea. And like with an orange, the juice comes shooting out your fingers. So with this, the um, particles uh, uh, from the, the atomic particles are going to come um, flying off and bumping into each other. And that's how you get a chain reaction. This is how a chain reaction works. Uh, and now, this is based on the uranium bomb. We'll talk about that in just a second. U-235, which is uranium-235, you know isotopes, right? So uranium exists in a, in a number of different isotopes, U-238 um, being the principal one, but you really need U-235, that's the most radioactive. And plutonium, almost all the isotopes of plutonium are highly radioactive. In any case, it works the same way no matter which metal you're using. Y um, when you squeeze or when you shoot a neutron into this or you squeeze it and you you push off neutrons uh, into it you split the atom so you split that nucleus into two pieces so they go flying off and little other bits little other neutrons come flying off as well extra neutrons that go flying into others so these will split those and send off neutrons to split others, to split others, to others. You know how a nuclear, how a, a, a chain reaction rolls. Every time you split one of these atoms, you remember your four fundamental forces? Well, you got a tremendous amount of energy packed into that nucleus. So when you rip it apart, you're releasing vast amounts of energy, huge amounts of energy. And that's how an atomic reaction works. So um, the, the plutonium bomb, uh, as I just mentioned, um, works by squeezing. Um, the uranium bomb 
uh, works with a sort of gun system. Um, you have your hollow, in, instead of having a an orange of uranium that you're squeezing, you've got this hollow tube of uranium at one end. You fire off again a conventional explosive. It throws it forward at your target cylinder, um, which is your uranium initiator, and this sets off again a chain reaction. So here's the deal. For a lot of complicated technical reasons, they were pretty sure the plutonium bomb would work. They were confident of that. They also had two uranium bombs, and they weren't so sure that their technology would work on that. So they decided to waste one, if you will, by setting it off here in the United States to see whether it worked and what happened. So on July 16, 1945, uh, the Trinity test took place um, out of the Los Alamos labs over at, by Alamogordo. Um, and the, the, what happened was, was just blew their minds. They knew it was going to be a big explosion, but um, the, the blast of the Trinity test created a fireball. The core temperature of that fireball was three times the heat of the sun. It, it was extraordinary. It really was extraordinary. Now, there are tons of good documentaries about the Trinity test, um, which I urge you, if you have any interest, to go look at, to go find. Tons of good documentaries. I'll just show you this uh, one, if I can get it to roll here. These are from the official cameras that were used that day to measure what was going on. And that's, there you go, this is the famous mushroom cloud that will become the symbol of the atomic age. And you just see the waves of heat there. The heat was so powerful that the entire floor of the desert, um, all around the, uh, well, I'll, I'll show you. The 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 um, uh, some years later, um, J. Robert Oppenheimer was interviewed. A famous interview he did uh, about what it was like to see that that day. Um, it's a very famous interview. I thought I'd, I'd show it to you. I know the sa sound when I do this, um, through this, is, is difficult to hear. I, I just, all I can do is urge you to make the best of it. Uh, and you can go look up this interview at some point, uh, if you want. Let me see if I can get this rolling. Try. 
It was a tremendously moving event, obviously, for these people. Okay, so they knew the atomic bomb worked, and now what? The war with Germany is over. That had ended back in April and May, really. Um, Hitler was dead in April, and by May, uh, the, all of the German troops had surrendered. But they're still fighting in Asia. And the U.S. is following this battle plan of going island to island to island to island to get closer and closer to the Japanese mainland, to, um, or Japanese main islands, to, um, to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. The closer we got to Japan, the more desperate the Japanese became. Um, you have heard of the kamikaze pilots. These were real things. Um, when Japan began to realize that it was losing the war and may not be able to win, they recruited um, hundreds of these young guys, and they would hold a funeral ceremony. You, you, they went out to their airplanes, and before they left on their missions, they were given a full-blown funeral at which they were present, and then they would get into the cockpit of their aircraft wearing their ceremonial um, religious funeral robes and drive these aircraft into American ships. Um, on land, the uh, dozens and dozens of the Japanese soldiers undertook these suicide attacks on Americans, and the Japanese civilians, when we would get to a Japanese-occupied um, island, would all commit suicide rather than be taken by Americans, in part that had to do with the Japanese sense of honor um, and, you know, the, they'd rather die than let the emperor down. In part, it was due to propaganda. They, the women were convinced that American soldiers were all there to rape them and slaughter their children. So better they take their own lives kind of a thing. So the fear was that if we staged an actual invasion of mainland Japan, or main, main island Japan, I should say, it's, it's an island, if we actually tried to invade Japan proper, the United States would take such incredible losses. Yes, we'd probably <coughs> inevitably win, but we would, it would be hundreds, possibly hundreds of thousands of men who would have to die in order to do this. And the Japanese civilian population itself would be wiped out by this, and it would be long and costly and bloody and brutal. That was the fear. So when Truman is thinking about what to do with these new weapons he has, and he's informed, well, I'll tell you when he's informed about this, but when he's thinking about this, he's got four things here that he wants to accomplish. One, he wants to avoid an invasion of Japan because he, he's being told by his generals that it's going to be um, unimaginably horribly bloody. Second, he wants to force the Japanese into immediate unconditional surrender, end the war instantly, get it done, over with. Third, he wants to eliminate the Soviets as players in Asia. Don't forget that... Um, Stalin had promised three months after the war in Europe is over, I'll be, I'll declare war in Japan and we'll go and we'll help you guys. But um, Truman is smart enough to know that if that happens, Stalin is going to take what he wants. So he will take Manchuria for himself. He will take, who knows, Korea for himself. He'll want a piece of Japan for himself. So if they can end the war before the Soviets actually get into it, this will keep him out. And <coughs> it's becoming increasingly clear by 45 that the post-war world is going to be divided between the East and the West. It's going to be divided between the Soviet Union and Soviet communism and the, quote, free world and the rest of the world. It, that's becoming, you know, that's becoming pretty clear. So Truman wants to scare Stalin to prevent him from doing more. The atomic bomb originally was 
not seen as the ultimate, and, and this is in Truman's time, talking about in this period I'm talking about, the atomic bomb was not seen as the ultimate weapon to use against Russia. It was seen as an equalizer to the Russian military. The Russian army was so vast, he had so many men under arms, the fear was that he would sweep across Europe and he would take Western Europe too and accomplish what Hitler couldn't. And the atomic bomb was going to equalize the West's ability to fight a war and therefore sort of um, keep Stalin contained. It wasn't viewed as the ultimate weapon that would make the United States forever dominant. <coughs> so those are the four things he really is thinking about um, as they talk about what to do with these weapons. There are some attempts within the government to persuade Truman to use these weapons he's got now, these atomic bombs, to scare the Japanese. That is, to set up some kind of a demonstration. Pick an island in the middle of the Pacific, use one of the bombs, and show them that we can eliminate the island from the face of the earth. And then they'll get the idea and they'll surrender. This was put forward primarily by scientists working on the weapon. As you saw with Oppenheimer, once they kind of saw what this thing could do, there were a lot of scientists that started to have regrets about working on this weapon. What have we unleashed here? You know, um, what, what genie have we let out of the bottle that we're not going to be able to control? It's one thing to get it before the Germans do, but now that we have it, is it ever actually moral to use an atomic weapon? Um, and they also knew that one, one of the principles that we'll talk about in religion when we do just war in morality, one of the principles in a moral war is that you avoid civilian casualties. You target only military targets. So, you know, guys who are in the uh, other guy's army, um, <coughs> even defense plants and things are legitimate targets, but not civilians. Well, the problem with the atomic bomb is there's no such thing as targeting a military facility with it. It's so powerful and so vast that, you know, yeah, you can drop it on a military base or a factory, but it's going to wipe out the whole city around it. <clears throat> so there were scientists who tried to go to Truman and talk him into some kind of demonstration project. But the demonstration project never really gets off the ground. There are too many people in government that believe that the Japanese wouldn't be convinced by that, that the only way to send them a signal is to use it on the main island of Japan. Um, that's what's going to scare them. Uh, there's this, again, I talked about this notion of total war, where it's not their army versus our army, it's their whole society versus our whole society, so everybody's a legitimate target. I'm not saying I agree with this, but this is the attitude many have. And so the demonstration idea never really gets off the ground. I also point out to you, by the way, this is all still secret. So... Um, Truman is not, in any of this, responding to public opinion. There is no public opinion about the atomic bomb because the public doesn't know it exists. This is all discussion within a very small group of military, political, and scientific advisors right around Truman. They choose two cities, Hiroshima and Kokura, um, to drop these bombs on. Hiroshima and Kokura are both um, uh, cities, but they have um, military industry in them. Um, some of you may recognize, for instance, Mitsubishi. Well, Mitsubishi were the people who made the um, the Zeros, the Japanese uh, fighter planes, among other things. Uh, they make cars now. Um, but, you know, you had defense plants in these cities. So, they were chosen for that reason. Uh, and I put in there Nagasaki. Kokura was the original second target. 
They decided that on August 6th they would go after Hiroshima, and on August 9th they go after Kokura. When they actually got in the air, when the planes got in the air, the cloud cover, the weather, was so bad over Kokura that they, they didn't have a clear drop. So they went to their secondary targets. Military U.S. bombers always have a um, secondary and tertiary targets, that is a backup target in case the first one doesn't pan out. And Nagasaki was actually the secondary target. I note, note there they don't go after Tokyo and Kyoto. Tokyo had been bombed and bombed and bombed and bombed, um, largely with incendiary bombs, fire bombs. Um, okay, most bombs will start a fire, but these are specially designed bombs, the purpose of which is to spread fire. And Tokyo, particularly at the time, was an all-wood city, traditional Japanese construction. So we had really devastated it. Um, and they didn't want to go after... The, and you know, it, if we had the time, it's a good debate. It'd be good to write a paper about if somebody wanted to. The morality of this. In your books on page 905, there is a varying viewpoints document. Don't miss it. The atomic bombs, were they justified? But you can find books and books and books that have been written on this subject. Um, because uh, cause I'm going to say something that sounds pretty horrific, and it is pretty horrific. One of the reasons they didn't choose Tokyo was because it had already been bombed. And they wanted a an untouched target so that they could get a clear measure of the effect of the weapon. Yeah, they wanted to take a city that had been relatively untouched by other bombs so that when they dropped the bomb on it, they could tell exactly what the devastation from this new bomb was, not confuse it with old damage. That's a pretty horrific thing, but that's the truth. Kyoto was avoided because um, it, there was some fear about the reaction. Kyoto was is the ancient city of Japan, it is the religious center. It would be like bombing Jerusalem, um, you know, today. It, it, it was the sacred city to um, the Shinto faith. So um, the they decided not to go after that one. So Hiroshima and, by extension, Nagasaki were picked. In the meantime... Now, I said July 16th, they do the test to find out if the bomb works. It works. At the same time they're doing the test, Harry Truman is leaving Washington to go to Europe for the Potsdam Conference. Now, I mentioned the Potsdam Conference previously. The Potsdam Conference was held in Potsdam, which is a suburb of Berlin, originally with Truman, Churchill, and Stalin. Uh... Churchill gets replaced partway through that conference, in the middle of that conference, by Clement Attlee. Um, Churchill was a wartime prime minister, and it is thought that now that we're about to go into peace, he's the wrong guy for the job, and so the British Parliament yanks him and puts in another guy as prime minister. That was a controversial decision, too. But it's Truman and originally Churchill and Stalin, and representatives of the other powers are there, including Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek was the um, generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, the, uh, the top general of China, and effectively the head of the Republic of China. Now, you know, after World War Two, China will go into its own revolution, and Chiang Kai-shek will fight Mao Zedong, and Mao will be prevail, and China will become communist China. But at the time, Chiang Kai-shek was in charge of free China, the, the area that had not been conquered by the Japanese and that was fighting the Japanese. Truman finds out, while he is um, uh, on his way to the conference, that the um, bomb works. 
So when he gets to Potsdam, he gets Churchill and Chiang Kai-shek. Notice not Stalin. He wants to keep Stalin out of the East. He gets Churchill and Chiang Kai-shek to issue with him the Potsdam Declaration, uh, July 26th, which warns Japan that they are to instantly, unconditionally surrender, and that if they don't, they are facing the possibility of devastating destruction of their country. It doesn't say we have an atomic bomb, but there are hints that we have a lot more power to hurt them than we're letting on. Of course, the Japanese um, dismiss this and don't buy it, don't believe it. So on August 6th, uh, Hiroshima is bombed, the first atomic bombing uh, in wartime or as a weapon in the world. 80,000 people are killed that day. A third of the city are killed instantly. Another 80,000 are injured. And then, of course, over time, um, those injuries will add up. A lot of those people will die of their injuries. And you begin to see this new phenomenon that nobody had ever heard of before called radiation sickness and radiation poisoning. They don't hear from the Japanese, and so on August 9th, Nagasaki is bombed. Originally, as I said, Kokura, but that proves a, a target that's not going to work, so they bomb Nagasaki instead. 35,000 are killed instantly, 60,000 injured, but really that death toll is just the instant death toll. Um, probably something more like 80,000 people die shortly after the bomb of their injuries. Um, the differences, by the way, in casualty numbers largely have to do with terrain. Uh, the, the exactly where the bomb fell and uh, you had the sort of um, bowl-shaped hillside around Nagasaki which contains some of it, blah blah blah. The same day that the US bombs Nagasaki, the Soviet Union declares war and starts to invade Manchuria. They want in. They want in. General Groves, head of the Manhattan Project, was all set to do another atomic bomb drop on August 19th. He had three more planned for September. He had at least three more planned after that. The Japanese, though, begin to realize they are dealing with something they cannot withstand. There is controversy among historians today as to what was the thing that pushed them over the edge. Was it the entry of the Soviet Union into the war? Or was it the two atomic bombs themselves? Either way, after much fighting within the top of the government, there was an attempt, uh, there, there was fighting within the cabinet, um, there was an attempt to take out the emperor. On August 15th, Emperor Hirohito um, makes an announcement over the radio to all of his people that Japan can no longer um, keep up the fight. It's called the Jewel Voice Broadcast because, again, it, the emperor was still considered to be a god. And so people... Um, well, uh, let me see if I can find a picture for you. So, you know, this is these. this was typical scenes all over Japan. You can see these people are in a devastated city. And uh, if this is the picture I'm remembering, I've seen from the other side, this is actually a picture of the emperor that they've set up next to the radio. And there they all are on their knees to listen to the words of the emperor. Um, you know, the... The, the the jewel voice was the the name of the the was the word used for the very words that came from the emperor's lips and he told them it was all over by september 2nd the formal um surrender was signed it was signed in tokyo bay aboard the deck of the uss missouri the missouri was one of the few battleships um that actually survived the Pearl Harbor attack. It was 
heavily damaged but repaired. It was flying from its mast. Um, the uh, uh, flag from uh, that it was flying the day that it was bombed, um, uh, among a number of other symbolic American flags. General Douglas MacArthur is there. That's MacArthur was the commander of U.S. forces in the Pacific, and these are the Japanese um, delegation, the ambassadors, and generals. And here, back here, all of these represent all of the Allied powers. So you can see, you can, or I can tell by their hats. These are the French delegation here. Um, this is uh, the British um, uh, uh, Royal Air Force is over here. Um, British Navy. Uh, these are all representatives of the Allied powers who are signing on behalf of the United States. With the surrender on September 2nd, the Second World War was over, but <coughs> a couple of things had begun. First, the Atomic Age. Um, war would never be the same. There was no place to hide. There was no, you know, the, the uh, atomic weapons were so overwhelming in their scope that, that there was nothing controllable about them, and they frightened everyone of where this was going to go. Um, second, we did not know it, but the Russians already had bits and pieces of our atomic technology. During uh, the Manhattan Project, there were Soviet spies or Soviet sympathizers among the scientists who had already started slipping um, nuclear secrets to them. Um, and so as the Second World War ended, the Cold War begins. Um, the world is now going to be divided between the free world, meaning the United States, Western Europe, and their allies, and the Soviet Union and its sphere of influence in the uh, East. The areas that the Soviets conquered back, if you will, from the Germans, puppet communist governments are installed in many of them, and so it extends Russia's sphere of influence into Western Europe. What will happen in the late 40s, 49, is when you have the communists take over in China and uh, a very complicated three-way kind of division of the world between um, the uh, West, the Russians, and then the Chinese who may be communists but they don't always get along with the Russians. And so the world is going to kind of be split into three over that period of time. But we'll get to that with the next lecture.